he's awesome. He's a wildcat ecologist um, who just graduated from the University of Georgia and is really involved in science communication. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about early career stuff today, which is going to be really exciting because I know it's really relevant for a lot of you guys out there who are watching the channel. So first, um, as I'm also interested in carnivore ecology, I'm really keen to ask you about your work of your thesis. So using camera traps to determine the territorial overlap of jaguars in Belize, right? Yes, correct. Um, so I did, my undergraduate, I did my undergraduate thesis looking at jaguars um, in the Mountain Pine Ridge Forest Reserve of Belize. Um, in like all thesis with your title, it, 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 it generally, it's going to change inevitably at some point in time based on the finished product of what you're getting with. So originally mm -hmm. I was going to be looking at, uh, territory dynamics between, um, jaguars because they're very solitary animals. And I was going to be using some multiple, uh, multiple, mul uh, excuse me, um, multiple minimum convex polygons, excuse me. Have some M MCP right. layers to understand how jaguars are overlapping in territories over each other, um, and mm -hmm. figuring out how that influences their behavior, like if they're dispersing from the air or like if they're competing a bit more. Um, and basically, I bit I kind of cascaded from that, and I turned that into an ArcGIS trajectory. So essentially, right. we had about 105 jaguars throughout the 16-year survey period. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, I wasn't there throughout the the 16-year <laughs> period. I was over there doing some field work for the month and um, collecting some data and helping them set up for it. But uh, I got the general database and Excel file to look at it for that period of time. Um, and so mm -hmm. basically what I was doing is I was trying to understand on the map because there are over 50 cameras that are put out into the study system. It's about right. 500 square kilometers in size and trying to understand <laughs> out, out of all the Jaguars that are caught on camera, um, you have multiple jaguars, different like multiple con specifics that are caught on camera in the same area, and I was trying to in understand the ecological implications that are influencing them to be photographed in the same area if they are in fact very territorial and solitary in those circumstances. And so, what I learned is that actually overlap doesn't actually happen from my sample size, from what I was getting out of much. I think I had about like on average, I think about three and a half jaguars are really overlapping in the same areas throughout the study system out of the 105 that we got over time. You have, and you have to imagine that's 105 throughout the 16 year period. So like if you were to break that down on more like um, more micro scales, you would probably find a bit more mm -hmm. uh, some, you would find, you would find some more, more details. Um, but the really cool part about it is I think what I enjoy for the art GIS is that. Sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. There you go. Am I breaking up? Oh, uh, for my ArcGIS, one of my hypotheticals was that water was one of the major influences um, influencing their behavior, whether it's resource allocation or the fact that they're uh, highly equipped to move throughout water. Um, they can swim easily over two kilometers in water and navigate throughout channels. They're, um, they're probably one of the most efficient felids when it comes to just different types of terrains that they have to utilize. Um, and so I integrated a spatial component to show all the... Um, all the the water that's in the area and it turns out you know i thought that maybe droughts could be influencing them and, and it turns right. out that droughts just don't happen in the area and so you know like any great point in science you're just like oh great like you know like i proved myself wrong so i must be like, my theory like, is completely yeah. incorrect <laughs> oh, no, yeah. just like i was like all right cool so like that's one down the drain i guess i've got to move on to the next one and um, awesome. so I figured out that droughts weren't a frequent occurrence out there. And then I started to think about, well, I was like, okay, well, I do know that the biome out there is actually fire dependent based on the vegetation. So right. I started to look at um, fire. And so I think that fires and hurricanes are actually one of the biggest influencers on, I think, causing dispersal between jaguars and also noting between the sex differentiation, the females and males. Right. They operate completely differently from each other. The females are highly elusive, highly cryptic. It's it's much more rare to get them on camera than the males are. Males are very bold. Um, I don't want to say aggressive, but I say aggressive in the terms of how they navigate. They'll use open roadways rather than navigating throughout all the brush and vegetation, which would be a bit mm -hmm. more a more of an, a nuisance for them because it's just probably annoying for them to navigate through that. Right. Um, and so you caught a lot more camera, a lot more males on camera than you did females naturally, as you would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, what I, I ran a KDE estimate out there 
from all the numbers of Jaguars that are caught on the camera in my 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 time period range was from 2008 to 2010 and from 2010 to 2016 and I didn't in integrate 2009 because nothing really happened and what I found was from that from the first primary point uh, uh, they were all concentrated in the center of those those water areas which I originally thought was going to be an influence on them and then afterwards they they scattered it was like they disappeared and I kind of had like a light <laughs> Or it's like, well, it's really cool because, like, I think that's when I really started to love spatial ecology. I was like, well, it's like you, I'm actually really able to extrapolate something out here without having to be there based on like the data that I have available to me. Um, and then they basically disappeared afterwards. And when I mean like they were gone, I mean like they were just like gone. Like there were some really far up north and there were some down south. But I mean like the numbers dropped significantly. Huh. Looking at this and I'm trying to understand them, like, what happened? Like, what occurred right. in this point in time that caused them to either disperse from the area temporarily or yeah. just not get caught on camera because that's also one of the limitations in uh, remote camera sensing you know you're talking about a static stationary um trapping area that they right. could easily navigate around if they chose to use a different corridor or a pathway right um, and so Basically, I think what I've gathered from that is I think there's some sort of ecological phenomenon. I think it has to either be like fires or hurricanes that I think are moving out there, or I, the fact that resource allocation is influencing them in a way where they are moving throughout their terrain differently, um, which is causing them to miss the cameras. There's a lot to still figure out, but uh, cool. it's kind of a summation of what I was doing out there. But it's really cool. If I could show you all the graphs and stuff, I would, but there's just some really <laughs> cool points where um where i graphed out how you know we didn't start out with 50 cameras throughout the project it was 24 and increased to 50 over time throughout the 16 years how big was your study area uh the study area is 500 square kilometers so, okay yeah That's yeah it's, like, it's it's not super big but based on the geography uh mm -hmm. it can be a little hard to navigate so it takes some more time to get to certain parts of the study area you know so sure. um well, we it's, got, yeah. it's relatively large i think for the study site um and you know one really cool thing i think i'll leave at this is that like you know i basically i plotted a graph where it was the number of cameras that were increasing over the years versus the number <laughs> of jaguars that are caught on camera and i want to say it's around 2008 or 2013 there's a point it's been a while since i've looked at the graph but like you obviously as you would imagine if you're increasing your cameras in the study system the taxi will Right, right. Naturally, the number of jaguars that you're going to catch will go up. But mm -hmm. there's a point where it gets to, I think, around like 2009 or something, and it plummets. It just like gets. So, they like it. So, and this is the point where I think around 2010 or so or 2009. Um, obviously, this is, mind you, this is starting from 2004, that right. we, hit, we hit 50 cameras in the site. And yet somehow the number of jaguar or jaguars plummets. Actually, I think in the year 2013, I think zero females or males were caught on camera. Ah. Like we got none. There were some like there were some years where we got like zero males or females. And like it's just weird because you're looking at all these cameras that have been put out there and you're like, what is happening out there? Right. Something's occurring. We don't know what it is. But we can make some inferences based on how we understand ecology, and uh, I think that's when I really got sucked into research, where I was like, "Oh, right. I, I you can like do figure out what the patterns are." Yeah. So, like, when you say like something happened kind of acute in that year, was it like all at once within a couple months, or was it kind of throughout the year? So, you know, there's a lot of data to break down, but. Generally, the way I looked at, it, I just looked at the general year. I could have did, I could have broken down like on a monthly level, but um, mm -hmm. I did have some. Uh, I think I had some. I think I had a database or a file that looked at. I think the land tenure. I think on a mm -hmm. monthly level, based on the number of captures that there were on the camera, and you, even on the 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 months, you did start to see a change over time. But generally, mm -hmm. I just I graphed it on a broad scale, and throughout that year, we didn't get anything. And it was just like, you know, like what happened? Like they just were gone. Could it be like disease, possibly as well? Like something with disease ecology as well? You said disease ecology? Yeah, could it could that be tied in as well as something? 
something. I like, think so. Okay. I mean, yes and no. I mean, you know, nothing's out of the impossible. That's what makes hypotheticals, I think, really fascinating. Right. Um, yeah. But I think based on how we understand this, the system out there, actually, jaguars are doing really well out in the mountain pine ridge. Um, they're, <laughs> they're, they're protected over in Belize. Um, they've done some astounding work with conservation over there. Um, and if I <laughs> recall correctly, I think the population is actually increasing. So. Excellent. Um, so I don't think disease is one of the major factors out there. And depending on where they are, too, they're facing different circumstances over the other. Like in the Coxcomb Ridge Basin, um, it's because it's a much more of a dense wetland. You know, mm -hmm. they're facing different types of environmental factors. But the Mountain Pine Ridge Forest is relatively, a, I don't want to say relatively dry, but mm -hmm. um, it's a cloud rainforest. So yeah. it, it, there, it, it's kind of a different gradient that they're moving throughout um, and uh, the patches of habitat that they're moving through are a little bit more dry than others. So I don't think they're facing disease as compared to um, other landscapes that they would have. Interesting. Well, it's still a lot of yeah. for me to read through too. But. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, there's a lot to unpack, so that's really exciting. Um, so one thing I really wanted to ask you is, as you're an early career practitioner, um, what are some of the barriers and the challenges that you've either personally experienced or witnessed um, in terms of getting into conservation? Because as we know, it's a really competitive field. It's hard to break in. So. Yeah, um, it's a great question. And uh, I think we kind of have to, like, first kind of address the elephant in the room. I think one of the yeah. barriers, you know, to be honest, I think is... I think it's the representation, you know, it's hard for people not to invest in you in a field of STEM when you don't look like anybody else around you in the field. Um, it's, it's been very hard for me in many ways. I've had my own personal successes, but I've had a lot of my own shortcomings because I, you know, when you're just a, a racially ambiguous curly headed kid running around right. chasing snakes and nobody else looks like you, it's hard for you to first off get your foot in the door and establish yourself amongst of elite scientific superiors that have no relation or resonance towards your background or your adversities and obstacles that you have, have had to overcome. But also when you think about the history of conservation too, that like many of these people's intrinsic values don't stem from wanting to increase diversity. That might not be their forethought. That doesn't make them malicious, vile people. Um, but it makes things harder because it's not at the back of their mind like it is for some of us that have to think about that every single day when we navigate this field. I think Make one of my biggest shortcomings, aside from just the long-term generational gaps that have been placed on minorities in STEM representation, um, right. I think overall, I th think is the fact, too, that like I never had a role model. I, I never had anybody to teach me this stuff growing up as a kid. I mean, I was I'm lucky enough that I was born this way to be passionate about wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thankful for this innate ability to just enjoy natural resources and see the phenomena around me, whatever those gifts might be that were bestowed on me the, through the universe. But like, I think the biggest thing is that like, you know, I never had anybody to teach me. And you always hear about those stories, the the grandfather tales of the old white, <laughs> yeah. you know, biologist with the scraggly right. beard who passes down all his knowledge to the person that, you know, was <laughs> mentored under him. And I never had that. And it's like, I was always looking for that, and, and I think because of that, in some ways, maybe I missed some opportunities um, sure. because yeah. I wasn't sure of the other um, elements or uh, supplemental resources that were already out there for me. Um, I think that's the hardest part, I think, getting into conservation is, I think, finding a, a niche for yourself, you know, trying to partition it, I guess you would say. Or, or <laughs> niche partitioning. Yeah. yeah. Trying to, try to niche partition the natural <laughs> resources field for ourselves. Yeah, um, no, it totally makes sense. I think also, um, but what's great is that, you know, I never had that either. I mean, I also never had kind of a mentor figure that looked like me and was, you know, interested in the same things. And I think that's one of the things that's really driving me um, in terms of wanting to succeed is that I want some kid to be able to look at me and say like, hey, they look like me or they're kind of like me and they're doing yeah. well. Yeah. No, uh, it's, you know, it's funny that yeah. you mentioned that because I was just talking to a group of friends where I'm like, I'm working on my GRP, the graduate research fellowship program. Right. Um, yeah. And I was like, should I talk about my experience as a person of color <laughs> in natural resources? Yeah. And a lot of them are like, yeah, of course. Like that's a intrinsic part of your development as a person in this field. And it's like, you know, one part of me was like, I feel like it's kind of a cop out. And another part of me, it's like, but that's a, 
it's integral. You know, well, it's it's right. it's, a, it's a fundamental component to like my being as a person. It, yeah. it would be for me not to include that, and I just think like those polarizing, I think thoughts or notions that I held in my head just kind of shows you, I think the effects of, I think, trying to navigate this field, and I think, appeal to an audience that might not understand, like, where you come from, and, you right. know, it's funny how you talk about, like, you were saying people looking at you, and then being inspired, because they go, like, oh, that person looks like me, I can also do this, too, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, I, I can still remember, like, as a kid, you know, when I was a kid, I was in California, my mom would call me downstairs, and I would run downstairs because she would put, you know, the, we had a VCR and she would record the old hey. Jeff Corp TV shows on the VCR. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> yeah and, you know, I would ever, every, time, every time I watched the episode, I was always like, man, I was like, I want to be just like him, you know, because he was my hero, you know, and my mom yeah. was like, you can't, Ty, it's like, just follow your dreams, like, chase your right. passion, like, don't give up, and I had an epiphany one time when I was frustrated and navigating the field of STEM and just Underrepresent, underrepresented and going through an identity crisis, all that stuff that just natural stuff that you go through in your undergrad <laughs> in college. Right. And, and, you know, it, it occurred to me when they had this epiphany. I was like, you know what? I was like, I'm the first person in, my, in the history of my family to pursue and study in the field of natural resources. And not only that, but like, I'm trailblazing yeah. the field. Like, almost in a way, I've become my own Jeff Corwin in a way for somebody else that's younger than me to see me right. and go, wow, I can be just like him. And I think that's exactly. really powerful. Yeah. And I also think it's really funny because sometimes like I, in my own personal experience, sometimes it feels like, you know, the field is, it hasn't made itself easy for me to enter. So I'm almost kind of like sitting at the table and it's like, maybe I'm not invited to the table, but like I've earned my place and I'm going to sit here, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know dang well I'm going to sit at this table whether you want me here or not. <laughs> right. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. So do you have any ideas about how we can try to make conservation more diverse? Because something that I've noticed a lot is that in many cases, you know, it's kind of whoever has the most starting funding wins in terms of people trying to get in because they can afford, like, things like unpaid internships and all that stuff. So there's a lot of, like, socioeconomic barriers. Do you have any ideas of ways that we could maybe – try to make it more accessible for underrepresented voices to be heard. Yeah, I, I do. I have a few strong points I think that I can um, give or offer. And I think one of the main things we have to start off in is like this idea, I think when people hire faculty in academia and ask a minuscule question of how they will radicalize or transform diversity, I think is completely mm -hmm. nuanced and outdated. I think it's an arbitrary right. question to ask somebody how they might in change diversity when you can't hold them accountable for it or have yeah. them really commit to something on an actual transformative plan down the road throughout their career as a faculty. Because then if they get tenure, you know, then they don't really have to do anything and then they can't, right. get, they can't get fired. So it's like, there's a lot of elitism in academia that we have to acknowledge. And I think like we need to be hiring people. We need to be integrating academics into the field of, um, you know, universities or NGOs uh, right. that have the intrinsic values of wanting to change diversity um, at the forefront of their mind. And I, I think we need to like really do a better job at like, really looking at the people that we're hiring and go like, what are these person's actual values in how does this benefit everybody else around them that doesn't have the same opportunities as them? How are they going to bring others up from the leg up or from those who don't have the same resources or those who don't have the same wealth or those who don't have the same academic luxuries um, and give back to communities, even if they don't look like them. And I, I feel like I would love to see more of that. You know, there's nothing wrong being a white professor but there's everything wrong being a white professor, having all of the academic resources around you and still right. not being able to notice the disparities that occur around you. That's one yeah. of the most baffling things to me, I think, in academia is how you have a dominated precedent of, of a demographic that dominates education, and yet somehow we're still not seeing large reformation occur around us based on all the educational resources that like are available to them and it's like yeah so i think it has to start there i think the second thing um 
and I wrote about this in an open essay where I was addressing the representation in STEM is that like it all starts from K through 12. Yeah, I mean, exactly. everything right. when it comes to STEM representation in science education, it is a K through 12 disparity generational education gap that we're seeing from you know low um, economic communities that don't have science accessibility. Um, their science classes or uh, science resources are defunded or non-existing in the first place, like we see a lot with a lot of music and arts circumstances in schools. Mm -hmm. um, and we got to start there. We got to we got to get kids engaged. We got to get kids outdoors. We got to let kids know that this is for you. It's for everybody. Natural resources is an exactly. open access resource. It is not just for one demographic that you see represented on media and TV and in literature over and over and over again. It's for every single human being on this planet. It is an unalienable resource that cannot be um, stripped from, uh, stripped of anybody as much as it seems like it might not be for us. And I, I think that's the most important thing for me because, you know, it's scary sometimes for me, but, you know, the maturation environment which you develop. Oh, you're lagging a little bit, yeah. Oh, I am. Did you catch that last part? Did you did you get that last part? The maturation environment, yeah. Uh, kind of a little bit. You got a little laggy. No worries. Oh no, I was I was just saying that the maturation environment which you develop in um plays a uh in, in an extensive role in how you develop as a person. You know, and sure. I was fortunate enough for my parents to see something that I was passionate about in invest in it, even if they didn't understand anything about yeah. it. And not everybody has that. And, and you know, sure. when people don't understand something or when people are unfamiliar to something that people are curious about, a lot of times mm -hmm. they might discourage them from chasing those career pathways because it's not traditional in their family history or not traditional yeah. in that represented demographic. And um, I think sometimes just encouraging people to chase their dreams can make a huge difference, but it's hard to do that if you don't see yourself in it or if you don't see a future for your loved ones going towards it. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I think another important point to bring up is that I feel that people who are not from diverse backgrounds are kind of almost paying lip service to diversity while actually making a real effort to revolutionize systems that you know would allow diverse people to succeed. And I think it's important to not just kind of say like, oh yeah, we welcome diverse people without putting systems in place that make it possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that's definitely a challenge. We need to see like actual, um, we need to see people taking initiative and actually executing <laughs> actions and change of policies and mandates and doctrines that really transform the way people actually start to get included. Like, you know, I agree with you, lip service mm -hmm. is, does no service to anybody uh, except yeah. for a pat on the back to those that you know dispute it. Right, that's awesome. Um, so, can we talk a little bit about misconceptions about science and being a scientist? So, something that I've kind of lampshaded a little bit on this channel is that I think that when people often think of a scientist and they're outside of sciences, they think of like a white guy with a lab coat and goggles. Um, <laughs> which neither of us are. So do you want to talk about kind of some of those misconceptions and how we can address them? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I like the, uh, like the mad scientist look like, um, <laughs> I can't remember his, uh, I think, is it, is it Doc Brown from back? Yes. Back then? Not right. Like, that's not like what most scientists look like, you know, it's not a guy with, with frayed, partially fried hair and a, a white lab <laughs> coat on and right. uh, glowing, uh, just polished black gloves um and uh you know so i think that's one of the big cases that's not what scientists looks like look like it's science is it's all inclusive all inclusive it's mm -hmm. multitudinous it's multifaceted it's lgbtq it's black people it's brown people it's right. it's asian people it's white people it's it's people who are transgender it's all communities yeah. that are included in this sphere to make science better on a theoretical level as we all provide and contribute our perspectives that are diverse from one another and extend off of each other. Um, I also think another misconception about science, I think I would like to go to more too, I think it's more of kind of, I think, the mental aspect. I think a lot of times when people think about scientists, I feel like they think we're just devoid of emotion. 
Um, oh yeah. Don't right. resonate with things emotionally. We're robots, um, basically. And that we're just like robotic in a, in a lot of ways. That we're one dimensional, we're single, one track minded, and we just perform calculations and execute algorithms. And we don't see the larger picture of life or actually understand human strife and trivialities when it's like that's actually entirely contrary as a fact because being in the field of STEM or being in the field of natural resources, I like to use that more as I think a better model, requires a considerable amount of, a considerable amount of emotion to be in this field. Nobody goes into the field of wildlife for fortune and profit in lucrative aspects. Exactly. You have to care a lot. You have to care deeply about this planet to sacrifice things to, yeah. for the betterment of the future for mankind. And yeah. I think if that doesn't say anything about human empathy or sympathy or emotions for this world regarding every single person that inhabits this planet, I mean, I don't know what does. I mean, you think the government bastardizes us, they defund us, they deregulate us and attack us in ways to strip us of accessible resources and the funding that we need to actually make a difference. Mm -hmm. And then not to mention the two, we're seeing in our socio-political climate that we have individuals who are gaining traction socially just by offering a contrarian narrative against science. The earth is flat. Science isn't real. You know, it's uh, the vaccines cause autism. And it's like we're constantly having to fight against the narrative that we've already <laughs> debunked or, or, um, or dismantled with actual proven empirical evidence. And it's like we have so many things stacked against us. And it's somehow, yet people still see us as almost the antagonists in some situations. And it's like, we're trying to make things better, you know? Yeah, I think it's a sense of seeing scientists as like separate from the rest of the world. And we're not, I mean, we can't be. I know that like with a lot of my work, it's working with communities. So it's a lot of making sure that communities are driving the work that we're doing and also making sure that they're on the same page. And a lot of that is, you know, you can't come in and kind of like, change systems without involving the people who are on the ground. And I think that's that's kind of a different kind of side of science that I think a lot of people think of. They think, you know, you kind of just come in and do stuff and leave, and that's not what we do at all, or at least that's not what we're trying to do, at least now that we're becoming a little bit more. Um, Historical where. parachute science was a, was a big issue. It, 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 yeah. Thankfully for diversity and inclusion, people are now addressing that because it would be exactly. more historical peers did not understand that on a collegiate level. And so, I mean, it's funny that you're bringing that up because parachute science is a thing. And now we're also trying to break that down too. So we got, we got a lot of work to do. So but, uh, yeah. we're, we're working on it. Definitely. Um, so can you talk a little bit about science communication and why that's so important? Because I think, again, I think a lot of people in terms of thinking about science, it's like, of course, we work on peer reviewed articles and papers and things like that. But how do you make science accessible to a layperson and get them excited? Yeah, so, you know, we, we've touched on socioeconomics. We've touched on um, impoverishment in, a, you know, low-income communities, um, a lack of science resources for individuals mm -hmm. that uh, don't have availability um, to it. Um, but one of those things I, I love to address is, like, science communication because I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. Sure. If you can't explain your research to the right. common man or woman or the general public in the world and give a reason as to why what the, give give a reason to why the things that you're doing are important and why people <laughs> should understand it on a fundamental level and all its intricacies then you're missing a critical component that comes within science. Science isn't just publication. The root word of science, the Latin context, of, which is which is scientia, means right. to know. And it, it, it's to know more about this world so that we can comprehend it in a way to live a better life for ourselves and also interact with the resources around them to coexist with, in harmony. And right. People sometimes just don't understand things. Just maybe they just had a bad science teacher. Maybe they didn't have science classes at all. Or maybe they just didn't have access to a library. And it's up to us. It is, it is fundamentally up to us with all of our jobs as role collaboratively to reach out to the public and tell people science is cool. It's super important. It's right. not complicated. It is not this 
elitist jargon based vernacular that you have to have all this fancy diction in order to comprehend that's not the case and unfortunately the reason why science communication is important is because you we have to address the fact that science historically was very elitist you're talking yeah. about a field that was based upon pe the, some of the smartest individuals using their intellect to solve problems in a way based on theoretics and applied mathematics in many circumstances. Right. And that's not accessible and tangible for a lot of people in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about postulating cosmic theory or space and time, and people can't touch that. You can observe it in some circumstances, but for many people, that's not a general form of knowledge. Yes. Yeah, but we can make it a general form of knowledge if you know how to communicate it properly. And I think science communication is really important for me because I think not only does it allow you to interact with people on a ground level, but I think it breaks a barrier and allows you to resonate with people that you're just like every other person. You know, exactly. I think it gives people familiarity and something that they can resonate with. That's cool. So do you want to talk a little bit about your science question Fridays? Yeah, cool. so PsyQ Friday, <laughs> is like my my magnum opus it's my birth child that uh that i'm really proud of <laughs> uh PsyQ friday is basically just an effort to give people the spotlight to talk about all the awesome stuff that they're doing in the field you know there are so many people as i previously mentioned that are involved in science and in the SciComm community that have something to say and, and unfortunately we're not celebrities. People aren't, you know, having us on talk shows. Uh, I mean, aside from the few people that have been on TV, you know, there's not a lot of science celebrities, but there are some. But you know, right. not everybody's not everybody's having us for interviews. We don't get book talks and TV shows, <laughs> and you know, not everybody's having us on um, NPR or radio podcasts. <laughs> and so, I think it's important, at least in our community, that we invest in each other. And I wanted to give people a chance to like have that spotlight and talk about the cool stuff that you're doing. Like, what does this research mean? How is this, you know, transformative for the future of science? Like, why are you pursuing this? What got you inspired? How did you become a scientist? Like, and give people a chance to just talk about their up, their, their come up, honestly. And I think that's why I really love doing PsyQ Fridays is because every additional feature that I have, I'm presenting a newfound character to the field that people might not have been aware of. And I give them a chance to introduce themselves to people who might appreciate some of the work that they're doing. Awesome. Um, and, you know, it's a big world out here and it's a, uh, it's hard enough as it is in our field. So it's right. like, why not give chance for people to have a little bit of a spotlight, you know, when something like that. That's super awesome. Um, so last kind of question. So as an early career practitioner, do you have any advice for anyone who's just starting out? Maybe they're still an undergrad or they've just left undergrad um, who's trying to, you know, get into the field and kind of learn their way. How, how do you think is the best way to do that? So <laughs> I think one of, my, one of my big forms of advice is first off, don't get discouraged. Things might be hard. Uh, things might seem trivial at times. Is right. Maybe you don't feel like you're on the right path, but I promise that you are. Stay vigilant. Um, and stay determined and stay confident and hungry for your own personal success. Um, yeah. The second thing I would note is um, utilize every single opportunity that you can. One thing that I look back on that I do regret in my program, I do have a lot of field, field experience, but take volunteer opportunities while you can while you're in college. Right. Because your finances are different at that point in time, but not too stratified to the point where, like, you can't afford not to take volunteer positions when you graduate from college because then you need to start actually like making a living. I think like if you have the time right. and you can afford to do it, do it because you can learn some really, really um, uh, important techniques, uh, wildlife techniques, may, may they be in that case, that uh, can, can contribute to um, some really strong field research skills and techniques. Um, so yeah. take volunteer opportunities while you can. If your professor offers for you to go out and do field work, field work with them, take it. You know, yeah. like those are opportunities that you don't want to miss out on. Um, ask your resources in your program. Ask people in um, outreach and scholarship offices that you in the program that you might be for um, grants and scholarships that you can apply to. There's tons of money just floating around in the world right. that 
people don't apply for. And uh, I've gotten some scholarships myself just by applying for them and just based on my demographic or, you know, my diversity or disabilities that I have. And, right. you know, it's just kind of crazy because it's like it's been here this whole time. And mm -hmm. if nobody told me, I would have never found it. You know, exactly. um, right. so I think those are the big things. I think is stay focused. Um, utilize all of your resources as much as you can. And then I think the third is just put yourself out there, too. You know, um, exactly. as much as I like to admit to the fact that, like, you know, I never really had a role model. I never really had anybody to directly invest in me. One thing I can say, though, is that I at least put myself out there to reach out with professors and ask for opportunities, even if I didn't get anything in return, because at least then I can say that I try. So go into professor's offices, read their papers, talk about okay. their research and show interest and say, how can I get involved? Can I contribute or volunteer under your, your lab? And then you'd be surprised some of the responses that you that's really awesome. And also get really good at Excel. Yeah, <laughs> and get really good at Excel and get good at R early. Yeah. 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 A lot of people are like, oh, I need to learn camera trapping. I'm like, yes, but also spreadsheets. Yeah, also spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah. People are like, oh, data analysis. And I'm like, yeah, definitely figure out R as soon as you can. R is important. It's a skill to learn. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And it's been fantastic meeting you. Yeah, Gabby, thanks so much for having me on. It's been really fun chatting with you. Yeah, it's been super fun. Bye. Bye, take it easy. See ya.